Thanks very much, Simon. Uh, we also have uh, on Troy. Um, so Troy, welcome Troy. So he's the head trainer at Malua Racing. Uh, Well-known racing personality, Troy, welcome along. Thanks, Corey. Yeah, thanks to everyone for uh, jumping on board as well. We have Matt Tillett, who's a sales and marketing manager for McAvoy Mitchell Racing. Uh, you'll notice that I've actually got a typo there in marketing. So luckily you're the marketing manager, Matt, and not me. But um, Matt Tillett from McAvoy Mitchell. Welcome, Matt. Thanks, Corey. I'll, I'll forgive you for that one. You've had a busy weekend, I hear. Congrats on the, your engagement. Thanks very much, mate. So, uh, we also have Will Bourne from the Kirama Stable. Um, he's the bloodstock manager there. Welcome, Will. Thanks for having me, Corey. Cheers. All right, so we'll get started. Um, firstly, I just want to if you have a look on the screen there, but there's so many sales. So the first question I have as as a newbie to the to the sport or somebody who'd like to buy a horse but doesn't know how, Simon, there's so many sales and Inglis is just one platform. There are several others, but we've we've got you on the show. So Inglis has been kind enough to support this. Uh, what are the different types of sales? How would you sum it up in a, in a I mean, obviously you don't have all day to do that, but uh, how would you sum up all of the sales that, that there are? Corey, in brief, we, we sell weanlings, which are, which are foals that have just been weaned off of their mums. So they are usually done at around about eight months of age. We sell yearlings, which are sold when they're around about 18 months of age. And the yearling market is, pride, is the predominant market of, of marketing of thoroughbreds in this country. Then we also sell racing stock and we sell brood mares. We sell basically all classes of thoroughbred bloodstock. We also sell ready to run horses, but probably if you wanted to pick one area of absolute specialty that most auction houses work on, it is the yearling market. Okay, that's a fantastic answer. What, what, this is a question that I have for yourself is, how do you choose which horses you put in each catalog? There seems to be so many catalogs. How, how does, as a sale, uh, how do you choose? Okay, it's, um, if I may give you an analogy, there are some people that want to drive Mini Miners. Um, there are some people that want to drive Commodores. There are some people that want to drive Porsches and some people want to drive Rolls Royces. So our job is to try and put them all into the respective yards where they fit the most. So if you're trying to put a Rolls Royce in a yard that's full of Mini Miners, you're probably going to struggle to sell the Rolls Royce because the buyers that are there are there to buy Mini Miners. If you're trying to sell a, a Commodore in a yard that's full of Porsches, it's probably going to be the horse or the, the, the car that's overlooked. So our job is to try and strategically place horses where from a pedigree and a confirmation viewpoint, they are going to financially fit. And most of the sales that we do talk about, be they English sales, Magic Million sales, or New Zealand bloodstock sales, have pretty much a, an average price. So for, if I pick on a sale like Melbourne Premier, a sale that averages around about $130,000. We're trying to put in there, in reality, horses that are mainly priced between, say, $50,000 and $200,000. So it's, it's, it's sort of structured as much around values and trying to put the right horse in the right spot so that, that the, the other guests that are on the panel tonight can go to that sale and know that they, they're, they're not there to try and buy a $1.5 million, $1 million I Am Invincible or a... $20,000 cheapy, they're there to buy a certain style of horse. So our job is to try and put them, put the, the pegs in the right holes. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and I guess for somebody who's coming into the market and, and might not know how to get involved, um, this is a question for Matt, who's a marketing manager. Um, Matt, it, it, there's not a lot on uh, pages with prices and things like that if you look at a stables website. Is there a reason for that? Is that illegal? requirement or what are the ways that people can get involved well to answer the first part Corey you're 100% right it is it's a legal requirement that a, a horse trainer can't actually advertise that they've got a specific share um, for sale for a certain price what what we're allowed to do is um, is identify what the purchase price of the whole was the, the whole horse was initially um, and then we need to try to drive people to make contact to us um, to then explain to them what what the final cost is um, based on the real the real costs of training a horse and all that sort of sort of thing. So um, in an ideal world, we'd probably like to be as transparent wherever possible, um, but it's a legal requirement that we're not actually allowed to even say, 
hey guys, shares available for for this amount. Um, yeah, there's a legal rule there, unfortunately. And it, it certainly is a bit of a hindrance, not only for the stables, but I believe as a as somebody looking to get into the market, sometimes it is quite difficult. Um, some some comments from participants have been surrounding the fact that they do feel a little bit silly when they first ring a stable to ask questions because they obviously don't know the prices and they just want to know and they don't want to be a burden. Uh, so, so I guess that's interesting for today because we will go into a lot of that. So my next question is for Troy. Troy, there's so many ways to enter the market for somebody that's new. How would you best summarize for a budget owner looking to get involved, so somebody that's new to the industry, what options are there? Obviously, we're going to go into the sales um, and we're going to use the sales as um, we're not going to add in all the costs that go with the sales. It's literally we're for the benefit of the briefs, we're going to look at the, the purchase price. But what, what other ways are there for people to get involved? So if they have you know, $5,000 and they want to get involved. Do they have $1,000 and they want to get involved? What what options do they have? Uh, there's so many options out there now, Corey, it's not funny. And the best thing that um, the public now has at their hands is the internet. Um, there's not much that the internet can't tell you nowadays. You know, whether you're going to buy a, a horse off a syndicator or a horse straight off a trainer, uh, they're basically the main two people that you'd want to be buying a horse off. Um, I don't know that there's too many other options. We actually get a lot of sales. Uh, you, you find that people sit there and watch results. So they will have done their homework and looked at um, catalogs and maybe seen something that they like or um, then they, all of a sudden they'll see who buys it. And we get a lot of inquiries like that. So, you know, they'll see that we bought um, Fox Wedge Philly for 75000 at Melbourne Premier. Um, and the next minute someone will contact myself or my bloodstock manager and just ask, is this horse going to be, uh, are you going to do shares in this horse? Is this going to be syndicated? Um, is it with a syndicator? And uh, that's a really good way for people to be able to get involved. No, and that's, that's a great point. I think coming back to the point before about silly questions, I think what, for, for new people coming into the industry, from my experience, uh, from people like yourself, is that no question is regarded as silly and that, that most stables will, will actually give their time as you're doing now to, to help explain it to people. So if you do want to get involved in the industry, pick up the phone and call, uh, ask the question. And honestly, I've found the industry personally to be really, really uh, friendly in that regard. So go ahead and do that guys. So what we're going to do now is we are going to go on to the brief. So you'll notice that I haven't uh, touched any questions here to Will, but he will come into his own in the, once we get to the premier sale because uh, Kieran Ma Stable did pretty much buy half of the horses there. So, um, Will, you will get a chance to chat then. Um, but what we will do now, guys, is talk about uh, the briefs in week one. Oh, so the first brief was Barry Bargain. So he put together a group of mates uh, and he wanted to buy a horse from the ready to race sale. So the reason I chose this is quite often if you you're not involved in the in the horse industry i think you basically want a horse that's going to go and run and you want a half decent horse and it, is this an option so my first question would be to you again troy on this is what what options are there for for this scenario so did, would you personally go to these sales and buy horses a hundred percent gory i i deal on both sides of the ready to run so I actually trade quite a few myself. Um, so I'll buy a yearling and then um, put them back through the ready to runs in the hope that uh, we get a higher price and, and can sell it on at a profit. So it is something that I'm uh, really up with and I, I, I really like. They've taken a little while to come into their own in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, they're very, very popular in the US, the ready to run sales. And they're also popular in Europe. They're really starting to catch on now um, there's just always been that little bit of cynicism, I think, from the, the buying public as far as the ready-to-runs go, that people think that, um, you know, that, that people know something and they're getting rid of them for a reason. But I really think that's starting to change and it definitely has over the last two years. You see some really good results coming out of them now and I think it's a great way to get involved. You can wait that little bit longer and uh, you can actually see the horse that you like and you can... You can watch it breeze up and, um, you know, there's, there's plenty of people out there to give advice on what to look for and everything like that. So I think it's a great opportunity 
for people to get involved a little bit later down the track. Yep, fantastic. And uh, Matt, just a question for yourself. I had a, a question come through from one of the participants just asking, what, what's the difference between a syndication and a share? So if, is if that, a syndication itself? Yeah, and a share. So that was the so, question that came through. So, Okay, sure, sure. So um, I suppose um, you've got a share basically just means you're a part owner in a horse, right? Yep. So um, a, a horse can, can, you can have a share of any size. It can be 100% right down to 1%. Um, that's, that's easy to structure. The reality is with racing in Australia, you can only have 20 names in a race book. So if you, if you start to cut up a horse into tiny little shares, then there are limits on how many registered owners you can have listed there. So, so what we then do, if we get a heap of you know, young blokes want to get into one horse, um, then we start to register syndicates, right? Which then means that that syndicate name can take up one spot in the race book. Mm -hmm. if, if that makes sense. Yeah, so yeah. That it's makes almost sense. Like, uh, yeah, so syndicate is kind of like um, a business um, and you can have a whole lot of mates jointly own that business and then that goes in into the horse. So you could have you could have 20 different syndicates in, in the one horse if you wanted to. Yep, yep. And here we go. So first one for Will. Will, you actually bought a horse in this sale. Um, it was a bull point. Um, why did you buy that horse? That's a good uh, question. Yeah, we were looking through the sale. We didn't really want to go hard. We thought we were going to, you know, uh, buy something there. Um, Bullpoint at the time was going well. It was a nice type, and we put a lot of emphasis on um, the broodmare lines. Uh, he was obviously out of a Galway on there, so we thought he might stretch out, have a bit of distance. Um, and what he sh was showing then was just sort of um, a bonus. Um, so him getting over a bit further distance, you know, we might send him to come into a nice three-year-old. And I think we paid around 80000 for him. So it wasn't the horse that's been broken in and ready to go, educated. Uh, we felt it was value and um, hoping it just improved into his three-year-old year. It's actually quite interesting that you bought a bull point in that sale because the only other panellist that we have on our four-week webinars that bought in that sale was actually David as a party and Dream Thoroughbreds. And they also bought a bull point. Um, and then interestingly enough, Simon selected that point in his as as his selection in the sale um which was the bull point and brazen hussy colt which is now brazen bull and has actually had a had a trial run um what what is it that it, uh, i mean obviously you spoke about the the dam side but what was, did you go into that sale looking for a bull point or you went uh, into the sale just looking no. um but we had no knock on the stallion and obviously um brewer Galileo is a big tip for a broodmare sire, um, and you can sort of overhaul the sire um, to a point. The ball point was doing no wrong at the point, and uh, we felt he was a nice horse. Yeah, awesome. And we had, so Simon, I'll, I'll pop you back on. So we had a couple of people that have sent in, so we've actually got three or four horses here that have been really popular from from people. Um, so we had the real impact in the Niagara Falls, uh, which has been selected by a few. Um, do, what are your thoughts on that uh, horse in the sale? Look, Corey, so many horses, when it comes down to horses and inspecting horses, it comes down to very much a personal to choice situation. Um, some people work very strongly off the bloodlines. You'll find nowadays the professional buyers first and foremost work off of confirmation. So the actual physical aspects of a horse are, are paramount. If a horse doesn't look like an athlete and the, the other three pounds, Analysts are involved with, with racing stables that continue to turn outstanding racehorses. You've got to buy an athlete in the first and for, is, that's first and foremost. Thereafter, you are always looking at various bloodlines to try and determine which ones appeal to you and don't. Um, a lot of people like to buy um, yearlings by, by proven size. Some like to buy yearlings by, by first season size. Some like to buy from female farmers that they know. So there's actually no hard and fast rule. The important thing for anybody who wishes to get involved in the industry, in my opinion, is to get involved with people. Right? Don't worry too much about the horse initially, get involved with the people. So if you go, and one of the things that English tries to do is encourage new owners to, to invest their energies in, in participating with, with highly recognised racing stables because those people do so much hard work in their selections of their horses, be that with x-rays, with scopes, with pedigrees and with confirmation. So, um, you know, 
uh, there's no great hard and fast rule. Otherwise, we all would have bought black caviar. And well, with the exception of Troy, um, we all loved it. But Troy was actually the underbidder on black caviar. So he, um, he was a, a fantastic judge. But if we all knew what we were doing, we'd all actually all buy black caviars. We'd all buy winks. We'd all buy these sort of champion horses. It's not that easy. So you've got to rely on good stables. Yep. So I'll, I'll actually go to Troy now. So Troy, a, a lot of talk there from Simon on the confirmation and how athletic um, the horse is, but, but some of these terms to the average person uh, getting involved in the industry, maybe they don't understand those terms. What, what, what basically do you first look at when you look at a horse? Is it, is it the pedigree? Is it, the, is it what the horse looks like? What, what attracts you to a horse in a sale? Yeah, I look the I don't know how the the other two boys look at yearlings, but I know that I don't let a pedigree sway me. So we'll go to a sale and basically pull out every horse. Uh, so we'll look at every horse once, and they they literally get probably thirty seconds each, and they've really got to grab you in that first thirty seconds. For mine, that's what that's what I see. And then I look closer if I really like them straight away. I'll look closer for reasons not to buy them. So I've got to, they've got to come out. There's got to be something about them that I like straight away. Um, and it's very hard to describe that athletic look. But um, the main, one of the main things that I look for in a filly is a filly that looks quite masculine and quite like a colt, big and strong. Uh, but there's just something about a, a yearling when it comes out in front of you. I reckon a, a, a light bulb goes off in your head. And you, you get a feeling straight away for that. And then you find reasons not to buy it or reasons that are going to differentiate your price. So you, you might, um, you know, you get a, the Dane Hill line was always over at the knee or back at the knee, as some people say. And, you know, something like that will come out and you can take that as a fault. And hopefully that, that get, can get you a little bit off in price. Yeah, thanks for that. And so this one's for Matt. Uh, why would you... Why would a trainer sell a horse at a ready to, to race sale and not, not continue to train them themselves? What, what benefit is there? Oh, look, so we don't get involved in it, Corey, ourselves, but I know there are certainly some trainers out there that do, and Troy touched on that he does before. Um, you know, perhaps it's a, it's a, it's a way of um, turning a profit. I mean, a lot of those ready-to-run sales, they, they sell, you know, a lot of those horses go to the, to the overseas market. Um, Hong Kong and even Singapore. So, if uh, you know, I suppose if if you had had a good eye and you had the facilities to break in a horse, maybe it's a it's a way to um, to to you know get a return on your investment a bit a bit sooner. Yep, um, that might be the reason. Yep, and Troy, a lot of horses in the ready to race sale ran between ten point five and twelve seconds, so around that similar mark. Uh, how, how many don't make that? How many uh, would you buy, look to get into that sale that just don't make it? Is it, is it sort well, of 50%, I, 100%? So. It's a really hard number to put a figure on. I, I don't get too involved with the... I don't get over, overwhelmed with the timings. I think they're, over in Europe, they actually don't post the times and it's up to the individual agent to block them themselves, which I find really interesting. You've really got to concentrate on the horse's gait um, and the way that they breeze up and the way that they're doing it, and whether they're hard on the bridle, whether the jockey's putting them under pressure. So I, I don't quite take as much on the times as some do. I think times are very big in Asia, which is our main market. So um, obviously you need, you need to run a decent time, but you do quite often see horses um, sometimes don't break, you know, don't break 11 or 12 um, and they still sell quite well. Now that's really interesting. It actually answers the next question as well, which was on times. Uh, and, and obviously, would you just look at the time, which is, you've just answered that. Uh, one, one here, we will just mention a few of the homework. So Super One and Orange Marmalade got a few mentions. Um, we had some fantastic homework on Your Song and Birkin. Um, so they were basically saying in the short trial that it looked to have some upside with some continued education. And also they spoke about it being Bob's eligible. So if you could just explain to us, Simon, some of the, some of the schemes that are in different states, um, including Inglis has one, which, which can benefit buyers. 
Sure, Corey. Well, firstly, um, Inglis has its own race series. So anybody who goes and purchases through the Inglis yearling sales and, and ready to race sales has the right to nominate their horses for a race series, which is actually about an $8 million added bonus prize money race series. So we race in this country for a phenomenal amount of money. We have great prize money, but um, all of the sales companies, uh, or when I say all, Magic Millions and Inglis, um, both provide a, an additional funding source through their own race series. And then certainly from state to state, and this includes WA and Queensland, South Australia, Victoria with Vobus, which is a phenomenal scheme. And I'm sure the boys on the panel would, would, test, would, be, would be testimony to that. And then through New South Wales, a Bob scheme is also a bonus scheme. This, whilst we are all racing for very, very, very good prize money, predominantly in, in, in Melbourne and in Sydney, the prize money can be added enormously by these bonus schemes. And you find that you can actually, in Victoria, you might go to um, out, uh, sort of country regions such as, say, Murtoa or Stahl or Mildura and find that the prize money is ten dollars or $12,000, but you can actually pick up something in the vicinity of an additional twenty dollars or $25,000 in bonus money. So that makes things and makes this industry so much more affordable. We are probably the most affordable country for racing horses anywhere in the world. Yeah, I'd agree with that for sure. So I'll keep moving on with some of the, the other, so we will do a vote. So in a second, guys, what we'll do is we'll put a poll up and you'll all vote on which horse you would go for. I actually cheated a little bit in mine, Simon, and I selected the Vancouver and Cunha. Um, it was, it's actually now running as Dunbar in WA and it's one, two from its first two starts. So through a little bit of this research that I've been doing before today, I, I got one that's already winning. So that's a little bit of a, a cheat Corey, sheet there. Corey, your job starts the English tomorrow, mate. <laughs> uh, and then uh, Headwater and Amalfi Dreams got a few mentions. Hincham Brook got, uh, with Capri got a few mentions. And um, Better Than Ready and Blessed Anna, were, they were the popular picks. And what I'll do now is I'll pop the poll up, guys, and we'll just start the voting. So launching the poll now. Let's see what we'll go for. So if everyone that's participating, if you, if you hop on there, vote for, you've heard the interest. Can you all see that up there? My partner's sitting across from me looking at it with her arms up saying, which one does she pick? But I would have thought she would pick the one that I picked. So, so we've got a lead here. Simon, what we we're hoping is later, um, obviously, your role as an auctioneer is quite interesting as well. So we thought maybe on the last one, if you can see, uh, can you see those going up, the percentages? Uh, no, I can't, Corey. You can't? Oh, that's a shame. I, I was hoping that you could and that you'd be able to sort of do it as if it was a sale and you were, and they were bids. <laughs> <laughs> I only wish it was that easy. No. Yes, no, that's okay. I didn't know no. if you could see it or not, so I thought I'd ask that question live and um, see how we went. So we're going through a couple more seconds, guys. One more minute. We've got, at the moment, Real Impact and Niagara Falls is leading with 27%. We have Vancouver and Seeking Attention in, with 16%, which is the one that Troy had chosen. Yep. We've got Brazen Bull and Brazen Hussey with 10%. Hinchinbrook is on 14%. So 30 more seconds, guys, and we'll end the poll. And 10 more seconds, get your votes in quickly. And we will end it there. And our winner is Real Impact and Niagara Falls, lot 113. <laughs> so they haven't listened to, uh, they, they've gone, they backed themselves in, our audience, and they've gone with what they first thought. Uh, and lot 113 has been purchased, so. The well one thing done. to remember, Corey, with these sorts of things, going with your gut feeling is always a very strong intuition that most of us have got in this business. So if your gut feeling tells you that, don't be frightened of standing behind it. That's fantastic. So uh, that's our first one out of the way. We will move on now to brief two. Uh, obviously, there's lots of questions coming through. What I'll try and do uh, for the audience is try and get through these questions so we are 
are able to do, we'll get through the brief, sorry, so then we can do the questions at the end. Uh, so the next one here is Aaron Averages. So we talked about the showcase session. So Simon, if you could just explain uh, what the showcase session is. So obviously Melbourne Premier has two sessions. Um, if you could just explain how that works. Sure, Corey. Look, what we've had, we've got in Melbourne is, um, we have two sessions of our major yearling sale conducted in March. It's referred to as the Premier, Premier Yearling Sale. It's always been referred to as the Premier One and the Premier Two. So we would actually have about 50% of the horses in Premier One and 50% the, the, the next, the next 50 of horses go into the Premier Two book. That totals just under 800 horses. Now we get about 2,200 applications for the Premier sale. So in reality, 800 of 2,200 make that Premier catalogue. And of that 800, we split it about 50-50. What we did this year was rather than referring to the P2 session as P2, we renamed it and gave it the, the, the name of Showcase. So we have a Melbourne Premier and the Melbourne Showcase session. And it was actually about 530 horses in the Premier session at around about 265 or thereabouts in the Showcase session. So it was the horses that probably we think are not going to make quite the same amount of money as horses in the Premier One session, in the Premier session, but they are always still some very good horses. So it's it's a it's a second level session. It's it's all, if you want to walk, walk down from the uh, from the from the from the Rolls Royces, we're back back down around the, the Porsches and the Mercedes. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. I've got a lot of questions coming through about X rays, so I'll give this one to Will. Uh, Will, how important are X rays uh, in vetting? How in your when you're going to the sale? How important? What emphasis do you put on that? I uh, work you wrong people to ask. I mean, I, I think we've got about two sets of x-rays done this year. Um, Kieran doesn't really put a lot of emphasis on them. He's had a lot of horses fail the vet um, and that have turned out to be good, good horses. So we do put a lot of emphasis on the scope. So we're happy to scope horses, look at video scopes. In terms of x-rays, um, I, mean, I think he tells the story Petit for Louis brought him to Classic Sale and he paid about 60 grand for it. And he said he had about five people run up to him after he brought it and said, oh my God, did you look at the x-rays? Um, he didn't. It obviously was very bad and the horse turned out to be very good. Uh, evidently, it may have caught up with her. She only ever had five starts in her life, but I think she won her first four and came fourth in a group one her fifth start. So it may have well caught up with her, um, but you were managed to you know, get enough out of her. Um, so look, we don't look at x-rays at all. Yeah, and how about you, Troy? I, um, I've got a horror story about x-rays, if you want, Corey. I, um, I actually bought Nature Strip. Um, he passed in, in the sale ring, and I'd seen him and I, I thought, gee, I haven't had that horse vetted. So I rushed down and um, Sean Buckley was selling the horse and his manager was a guy named Toby. I said, Toby, I'll take that horse. I just need to get his x-rays done. And I rang my vet and got his x-rays done and he said, oh, don't touch him. That's so, a, that is a horror story. Through. Yeah, well, I think it's a horror, horror story. Horror anyway. story. He was, yeah. interestingly enough, he was the most popular horse uh, in our original form that I sent out with expressions of interest. He was the most popular horse there, Troy. So, yeah. you know, well, I bought I, him and uh, I, I no longer have him. That's a, that's a shame. And just uh, with uh, one for Matt, so scope, um, we'll mention scope, but if you could just explain that to us, Matt, what is scope? Sure. So the scope, the scope is putting a video camera um, up the horse's uh, nose to check its, um, check its airways, basically, um, to see how, how clear its breathing is. Um, because as we all know, racehorses are, are athletes, so they need to be taking a lot of oxygen in um, you know, when they're putting their body under all that stress to run as fast as they can. So um, scope is very important. It's something that we, uh, I'd say most trainers would, would certainly would check. Um, and then even, even when a horse is in training, they're, they're constantly getting scoped um, pre-race, post-race, all that sort of stuff, because um, their airways are, you know, one of the most important parts of their anatomy. Now, we've got some pretty interesting uh, stats here. So... We had $2.1 million the master able spent at this sale and bought 22 horses. Um, Malua Racing bought five horses. McAvoy Mitchell bought four horses. So we have the right people on, on this webinar to, to navigate us through. 
Will, just a, a question on that. What do you look for when you when you go to the sale? What type of buyers are you buying for? With 22 horses, I imagine there's a, a wide variety of um, briefs that you have when you go into the sale. So imagine these, these guys that are participating today have maybe spent a couple of hours doing the briefs that we're discussing. With 22 horses that you've bought in a sale, you would have had several briefs, I imagine. Um, we have one to be honest um i'm just trying to think i think we brought uh, a my boy charlie philly out of gill guys draft uh for colin mckenna um for 110,000. other than that i don't really think we had someone lined up for a horse uh before that um especially at the melbourne premier sale uh it's sort of good buying good value um i was a little bit nervous i think it was like 37 when we paid 480 for a for a tfl with no one for it um, so luckily we got that sold within the first hour. But other than that, I don't think we had a horse that was uh, we purchased that was sort of pre-sale, if that makes sense. I think we brought one horse for Colin McKenna. That was a yep. Good yep. So, so obviously um, they went pretty much like hotcakes, the, the horses you did buy. So you, you must have been fairly confident you had some um, respected owners that would jump in if you got the right horses. Well, the sale season starts in January and then we work through to um, the last sale being Easter. Uh, um, so look, we, we kicked off in January and we purchased 27 horses. Uh, we walked away we, from that sale. We only had half a horse left to sell. Um, so we went to New Zealand, um, did the same thing. We had one horse left over. So um, any horse we, you know, Kieran's very, very good guy to work for. Any horse that he, you know, you like, you're allowed to buy. Um, you know, our clients seem to back us and we're pretty grateful for that. Um, so when it came to Melbourne, we didn't really have much on the liability sheet. COVID sort of hadn't hit at that stage. Um, and we feel there's always good value in Melbourne. And, you know, Kieran's done some really good shopping in there. Obviously, Jamaica, we purchased for 120, 130,000. Um, so to sale, we're kind of, kind of keen to get around. Um, and there's some quality horses there. And, and how much goes into the pre-sale? Uh, in terms of inspecting horses and contacting vendors, checking their pedigrees, all of that type of thing before you actually get to the sales ring? I'm um, checking pedigrees, not so much. I do a fair few statistics on stallions. Um, do a lot of research on farms. Uh, I personally put a lot of emphasis on that. You know, people that can breed good horses often do so um, continually. Um, so we look a lot at that. Um, and we, Obviously, Kieran has a little bit biased views on stallions. Um, sometimes trainers, you know, a, a horse can have sort of 100 foals, 120 foals for the year, and they get two bad ones, and suddenly they don't like the stallions. So you've got to try and work past that. But at the same time, it's hard to, and it's sort of your own experience. You've stumbled up the money you paid for the horse, and it's slow. Um, so you go in with a few preconceived ideas, uh, but you try and look at it very broadly. A good horse can come from anywhere, um, but you try and play the statistics if that makes sense. Yep. Uh, you're going to go hard on a horse, um, a proven stallion, proven vendor, um, because I believe you know that's got a lot to do with it. Yep, no, that makes complete sense. And Matt, um, is it similar for you guys when you go into a sale? Do you have uh, owners that that are giving you a brief to go and buy the horses, or quite often do you get to the sale and look at the horses and then make your decisions then? Yeah, I'd have to agree a hundred percent. In an ideal world, Corey, we would just we'd have people lined up with an order for us. Um, but nowadays it just doesn't seem to happen. Um, and I think the other boys would probably agree with that. Um how the, the industry is sort of heading is um in my view anyway, is that people seem to take smaller shares. Um they like to have an interest in several horses uh, as opposed to being, you know, a, just a, a one one man, uh, one horse sort of a, a system. So, which I think is a great thing. Um, you know, there's no extra cost. If you've got a combined amount um, equity of 50%, the cost probably won't be much different if that's all in, in one horse or if that's spread over five horses, you know? So um, I think for that reason, a lot of our owners will sit back and they'll wait to see what we pick up and then they'll go through them all and they, you know, some of our big owners might say, you know, I'll take 10% of this one, this one, this one, and five of this one and 20 of that one, you know, that sort of stuff's happening a bit more. Yep. And I think probably something you mentioned there that's interesting, and I guess with syndicating and shares uh, becoming more prominent in Australia, is 
a lot of people do say that that you're better off to have uh, 10% in 10 horses than 100% in one horse um, if you're new to the industry. And I think people like to to spread their risk, so to speak. Um, I know that um, myself and my mates, when we made a syndicate, did that. We actually had enough to buy 2.5 in in a horse each, and we we bought three horses with 2.5 in each and split it between the three of us. So I think um, that that's happening more and more, like you said, uh, Troy. We, we, we're just going to go through some of the, the horses that were in the sale um, that people have found popular. Um, so you've actually got a couple of horses in there yourself that you bought. Um, Simon selected the Toronado a little loose, uh, which was popular with our participants as well. Uh, we had the Astern and the Element of Danger with uh, Gay and Gay Waterhouse and Adrian Bott, which people have found quite interesting. Uh, Cable Bay with Archie Alexander, which people have found quite interesting. So what, what were your thoughts on, on the showcase session this year when you were at the sale? Oh, look, at, I always find it a really good sale and um, there's always terrific buying to be done at Melbourne. It's one of my favourite sales. The only part I don't like about it is it that you had a normal, you know, you go to the Sydney Easter sale, you've got, um, you don't have to work your horses in the morning usually when you're up there. And you can you can have a bit of a lion and still do your work. Whereas in Melbourne, you've got to go to track work all morning, finish track work at about eight o'clock, and then straight out to the sales. And you don't usually finish till about six o'clock at night. So it's it's extremely hard work for about probably fourteen days between uh, going out there. But uh, there's always really good value to be had at Melbourne, and it's one of my favourite sales. We try and look at it. I've got you know a team of there's probably three or four of us that we always. Uh, look together and we probably end up looking at every horse and there's always good value to be had and thank Christ that uh, you know Will, Matt and I don't all like the same horses because uh, they'd, we'd all be on the same ones and then no one would be able to get anything but yeah. I think there's a really good broad range and, and you do get a good pick. Yeah and and Simon we've got a large range and we'll, we'll get the poll up in a second but uh We've got a large range of answers for this brief, probably more than any of the other briefs uh, with Aaron averages. Um, so although it's a showcase, a lot of people have put in their brief that they would actually spend similar amounts that they could in the showcase and still go for something in the premier with the budget that Aaron averages has come, come in with. Um, so I guess with the options in the sale, would, would you... Potentially, if you've got a brief like this, would you go in and then change your mind when you get there? Or, or how many buyers do you see come in and change their mind once they get to the sale? Corey, there are a number of buyers who do come to a sale, like a session like the showcase session, and simply want to buy from there because they believe it's going to be a little bit cheaper. That's probably, for me, um, not the first part of your homework. Your first part of your homework is probably getting to your respective if somebody wants to get involved in the industry and they've got whether it's whether it's five thousand dollars or or fifty thousand dollars the best thing to do in my opinion is to probably start to identify a training community people that you'd like to be involved with um, racing horses so if you go through to Will Bourne or Matt Tillard or Troy Corstens and say to them look I'm really interested in having a, a horse involved in your stable what have you identified in this respective sale which has got nearly 800 horses in it um, whether they whether they identify a horse that's worth five hundred thousand or a horse that's worth fifty, it's the important part is is to actually work out where you want to be in the first place. Leave them to be the specialists in the selection of the horses. So the best thing you can probably do is go to these boys, boys and sit back and say, look, you know, I've got five thousand dollars to invest, um, and if that ends up buying me ten percent of a of a, of a fifty thousand dollar horse or five percent of a hundred thousand dollar horse, it doesn't really matter. The important thing is to be involved with the, a selection process that gets you a really good horse. Yeah, no, that's really good advice. And and I guess something else that's interesting, and the reason I chose the sales as the first brief it, is I knew it would overwhelm a lot of people like it did myself 12 months ago. Uh, now that I understand the sales a little bit more, uh, as as somebody who might come in and say, hey, I've got you know $2,000 I'd like to spend, you can actually look at the sales results, look at who bought it, and then go to them and say, look, I like that horse. Would you give me you know, 2.5%, 5%, 10%, whatever you can afford in that horse once it's already been sold? Um, and quite often you can actually 
know, when I say trusted buyers, but you can look at stables that are doing well. And if they buy the horse that you like, that's also an option. So for the participants out there, what we'll do though, we will bring up the poll. So the next poll here, um, the showcase ses uh, session, and it's launched now. So get your votes in guys. We'll try and make this one quick. So one minute and let's roll. Early leader is the choice here, Eloquent Ruby. Pride of Dubai and Classy Chloe has hit the lead. <laughs> it's like watching a live race here, but I can't bet on it. So Pride of Dubai and Classy Chloe has got 31%. So 10 more seconds, guys. Ooh, little late comeback here, the Toronado and Bella Princess. We've also got the option of spreading our risk across multiple, which is getting a few votes. And we'll end it there. It's lot 563, the pride of Dubai. So that's the winner of this one. The pride of Dubai, 563. I'll just check who that was bought by in the sale, or do you have that there readily available, Simon? Uh, I haven't actually. It was Andrew over 150,000. Who bought it, boy? Lindsay Park, Andrew Williams. Okay. Lindsay Park, yeah. So, very, very nice. We'll, we'll move on to the next one. So, but before we do that, Will, would you care to explain this to us? This was set up at this very sale by your, your yard. I noticed that it's in French at the top. Yeah, uh, yeah, we have Romy, uh, she writes track work for us and she comes and helps out. Obviously, it was all hands on deck at the Melbourne Premier Sale. Uh, so she chose to put a spin on it. I've got terrible hand on it, so I left that to her. Um, but I just found, obviously, we're all, it was, you know, uh, an active sale. So they're buying, you know, we're buying 25 horses. We're bidding on 60 horses. So we're very busy for the day trying to work it all out, uh, what we've got left in each horse. Um, so it's actually very efficient in the sense of if, uh, you want to come in a horse with Kieran Ma, you look at the board, you can see what we purchased and what's left instead of, uh, you know, um, the Tavistock, can I get into that? Well, no, you can't, that's a message back or, you know, you have to keep calling. It's all there in front of you, everything we purchased. Um, and yeah, uh, everyone, everyone sort of come in, had a drink and looked at the board and sort of got in contact. No, that's, that's, it's really interesting. I actually was following this live at the time when I, I wasn't actually looking to buy a horse up, but I was still following it. I thought it was intriguing that it was just getting updated the whole time and how quickly they were selling. Um, and obviously you look at the amounts that they were sold for. Um, so for the average person, they do look like that's maybe out of touch, but like we've been speaking about, you can get such small shares in horses now that, that you can get involved with a, with a small amount. Uh, then, that was right. Like people just hold. Like it's amazing the amount of. I can even imagine going into the mountain. So you pay four hundred thousand, five hundred thousand for a horse. Not a single person for it. And within two minutes, everyone liked that horse, but didn't want to underpin it. You want to be one hundred percent liable for it, and happy to go in twenty percent. Happy to go in forty percent. Happy to go in, um, you know, a large proportion, but didn't want to bid. Didn't want to underpin it. Didn't want to make the price higher, because at the end of the day, for if a client wants to go on a horse, you know, like for instance, a Terrafio that was purchasing, they won't be a client of us and Walla. So if they want to bid above us, they want, they're going to be on the same product, um, more expensive pretty much. So they often sit back, uh, see who's buying it, and then probably approach whoever's stable buys it. Yep, yep. And just for the participants, we do have some questions that haven't been answered yet, but we will answer those as quick as we can once we get through. Uh, there's a Star Spangled Banner there at the bottom, and, and a question for Troy. Um, I know you've got a bit of a, uh, a good luck story here, Troy, to go with your nature strip negative one. Um, but Star Spangled, uh, Spangled Banner, um, if you could tell us a little bit on that story, because obviously starting off as an owner coming in and maybe not spending loads of money, like you, you only really need to get lucky once, don't you? Yeah, pretty much. And, and he was a fantastic horse for us, Corey. We, we were under bitter on um, Black Caviar, but not too much late. I think it was, it was either just before 
before or just after we, we bid 120,000 on a Schwarzier colt. Um, with Brad Spicer, Brad Syndi Brad's a syndicator and syndicated him and he was a, a horse that went very quickly. He sold, oh, I think, by about eight o'clock that night, which is very quick in, in our terms. Um, turned out to be Star Spangled Banner, went on to win a Caulfield Guineas for us. We then managed to sell him to Coolmore Stud for 10 million and went on and won another three group ones for them. So uh, really a, a great story there. And, doesn't happen all the time, but it does happen. Yeah, no, that, that's it's a great story. I did get told that you had a really good one on that. So what I'm going to do now is brief three. So this is obviously pretty much Gary Greenbacks is coming in. He's happy to buy whatever you have as long as it's good. Um, he wants to get involved. And I'll go through some of the, interestingly enough, some of the people who have chosen horses from the stables we have on. So I will firstly touch on... Uh, with Matt, I noticed that you bought an Alpine Eagle, a Tassie horse, in this sale. What, what, what was the reasoning behind that? Uh, obviously, uh, the Tassie horses don't get as big a um, exposure, but yeah, it's an interesting one for our Tassie members. Sure thing. So um, Tony McAvoy actually trained Alpine Eagle, um, and he was a very he was a very talented horse, but he didn't quite win the Group One. So. Um, I suppose for that reason, he probably doesn't find a home at the big commercial studs in the Hunter Valley. Um, but luckily for the, for the horse's uh, future, he got snapped up by Armadale Stud in, in Tassie, who, um, you know, probably the shining light down there. They do a really good job. Uh, so for that reason, um, they, they managed the horse really well. They got some really good mares to him. Um, and so they, they were predominantly the vendor of most of the Alpine Eagles um, of the yearling sales season. We, we flew down to Tassie, Tony and I, uh, looking to buy one down there. Um, um, unfortunately, the, the couple that we landed on um, had some minor x-ray issues, which were a bit of a shame. So we couldn't bid on them. Um, and then uh, they, they bought a couple more um, over to Melbourne and same thing unfortunately happened. Um, and we ended up buying an Alpine Eagle, um, not off Armadale, but off um, Oakford Thoroughbreds. So, yeah, so the, the story is, you know, Tony loved the, the, the horse. Um, he's really impressed with his progeny, but um, there was only one we could end up bidding on um, due to the, you know, bettering requirements that we have. Now, we've just got a couple of prizes. So I've got a signed Craig Williams cap here, um, which will go to who I, I'll choose one person that's done, done amazing homework, um, and I'll send that out to them. But we've also got an Inglis, an Inglis sale cap here as well. Um, which will go to whichever horse wins this poll on this one. We will then choose somebody from that that list that, that has actually submitted that horse uh, and we'll choose the best homework from that for the Inglis hat. So uh, I'm going to go to Will. So Will, a few people have mentioned the Street Boss and Cupid. They've also... Uh, and also a popular one was the Manhattan Rain Personal and Sign, and then yourself, you you picked the Tiafilo and the Andes as your favourite. What? Why those three? Uh, well, Tiafilo was actually she's an only girl record saying he was one of my favourite yearling of the whole year that we purchased. I absolutely loved him. Um, I thought he was going to be a lot cheaper than he was. Um, I think it was us and Chris Wilder going pretty hard, but no. I uh, I absolutely love that horse. Um, proper page. Tia Filo, kind of a straight crime mare. Um, no, I loved him and Kieran loved him. and I'm actually thrilled that we ended up getting him in the stable. Had a sort of a nervous 15 minutes when we had no one for the horse. Um, but, yeah, it's all worked out. Uh, Manhattan Rain. So she's an interesting one. Uh, she's a really nice horse. We paid 310 for her. Uh, she's a filly that's got a lot of residuals. So if she... Get a tendon tomorrow and break down should be worth around 100 150 grand so um, not completely torching your money if the worst to happen we actually so she's a half to fontaton who uh, we actually brought the stencil out of fontaton for 600,000 or sorry 575 at the um, magic million sale uh, so we love the colts it's a cold out of her um, so the family's uh, yeah a progressive family uh, she's a complete outcross to Danehill. Um, and she's a half to Fontaton and hopefully the family's going to do a little bit more with um, 
with the stencil out of her, you know, hopefully win the Magic Moons or something like that. So we thought it was a progressive family, a nice type, an investment. Um, and, yeah, I, I sort of saw if she could win a city race, she's worth what we paid for, you know, and hopefully she can be a little bit better. Um, so what was the third horse you were talking about? Uh, it was the Manhattan Rain. And it was the Manhattan Rain, it was the Teofilo, and it was the Street Boss and Cupid. Street Boss Cupid, um, yeah, he's a nice colt. Uh, we brought him off New Haven, uh, very good breeders. Uh, you know, we, we like Street Boss. He obviously doesn't cover a lot of, lot of mares. Um, I know him from working with the Dolphin. He obviously had Hansi Ape running around the time. We were very similar to him. He's one that we only sort of got 60% sold at the at the sales. Since being broken in, our breaker loves him. I think he put a few mates in. I think Kieran taken him a little bit of share. Um, he's all sold now. Uh, he looks like he would go early. Um, he's pure speed. Uh, yep. Yeah. So hopefully he can be going to a race like the Showdown or the Blue Diamond or something like that. Yeah, and some you mentioned. Of- something you mentioned with the Manhattan Rain was the the potential sale value at the end. Um, can you explain the residual values, the difference between maybe purchasing a Colt or purchasing a filly at one of these sales? Yeah, so a filly like her. Um, you know, if she can't run, she's worth something. So, uh, yeah, she if she can win a city, so if she can win a city race, she's worth probably what you paid for um, after after her racing career. Um, she's not a generation away. She's a half to a very good horse, a very good two year old. Um, she's free of Daniel, which is very rare. Um, and I thought there was just a lot of residual there, and it was yeah, she was a good investment if that makes sense um, because. You know, if you actually go to uh, the broodmare sales in, or just to the chairman sale, just gone and the Magic Millions sale, um, they're quite exy broodmares, especially the well-bred ones that love the form. Yep, and guys, just uh, Troy's just sent me through a, a message there that um, if you if there's any questions that the panelists can answer uh, by typing while while you're not uh, answering questions here, then I'm fine with you doing that. So that'd be great for our participants so we can wrap up quickly at the end. Uh, the next one is, uh, that was really popular in the sale. So Simon, you might be able to touch on this, was the, the schnitzel and provocative. Um, obviously it's the adults choice and Zabil line um, bought by Paul Moroni. What were your thoughts on that uh, at the sale? Well, firstly, if somebody like Paul Moroni buys it, you, you can rest assured that the, the horse is a very nice horse. Again, she's a filly with, with great residual value. She's by, by probably one of the finest sires the country has seen in the last, in the last 20 years in Snitzel. Um, my notes on her, she's out, of a, she's out of a stakes winning daughter of Zabil, and Zabil has been a phenomenal influence both as a sire and as a broodmare sire. And she was a filly that was very much a Zabil type. So it's interesting that sometimes you do get, when you've got a blend of, of two sires, in, in this case, Snitzel and Zabil. Snitzel and Zabil are very, very different. And she was more cut to the, to the mold of a Zabil. And Paul Moroni and, and his brother, Mike, are a couple of Kiwi, Kiwi boys. Uh, Mike is obviously an outstanding trainer based at Flemington. And Paul is one of uh, probably the world's very best bloodstock agents. So... Um, I would not question their judgment. I'd be honest with you and say that she probably wasn't my favourite horse in the sale, but she made a lot of money. She made $400,000 and she was a very popular filly, I hope, for, uh, for the stable that she runs really well for them. And I noticed you had uh, Snitzel and Madam Gangster as your favourite. Why did you like that one more? Uh, I'll have to go and have a look at my notes on that one, but it would be, uh, bear with me two seconds. 281. Because what I, what I did with this... Corey was, I went through, yes, look, I, I loved him. Firstly, um, he, for me, was, he was, he's obviously by Snitzel, so he's got, um, he's got dual purpose value if he can run. So when, you, when you're going and buying a colt of this quality, you're hoping that you might be able to do a Star Spangled Banner, as Troy was just explaining, and, and ultimately see him go and win Group 1 races um, in this country and overseas, and ultimately be sold as a stadium. Uh, this, this colt was out of a, a group-winning daughter of Alma Herr, a mare called Madam Gangster. But he was just a beautifully balanced, lovely style of a horse. He was purchased by Aquis, who are very good judges themselves. But for me, he was a very masculine cult and the sort of cult that I could see performing as a, a precocious young juvenile and probably into his three-year-old days. And I could see residual value in him. He made 
$250,000. And I'll be honest, I valued him at, at in excess of a half a million dollars. So I hope for, uh, for Aquas that he ends up being a very, very well bought cult. Another one that was not uh, bought by one of our panelists, but obviously has a lot of residual value and a lot of interest was the Frankel and Asadi. So it was a, was a Frankel filly, I believe. So to okay, Azad, to Azadi. Oh, no, I'll put you on the spot. Yeah, but. Probably one of the, she was a lovely filly. Um, one of the, the greatest racehorses that this can, that, that the world has seen in probably the last hundred years in Frankel. And he's, he's done a phenomenal job at stud. Uh, this filly was out of a, well, she was a half sister to a stakes winner by the name of All Legal. A very nice female family. Look, she was very well presented at the sale by Esker Lodge. They do a great job in the presentation of their horses. And a horse like Franca was obviously going to be commanding a great deal of attention. So she was probably, for me, quite quite well sold. I think that the, the vendor did well by selling her at $300,000. But again, we can't see inside them. So we hope, like Billy-O, that she's going to be a champion racehorse. Yeah, for sure. And I, I have had a couple of people mention that they need to, to duck off. It is eight o'clock now, but we will try and wrap it up in the next 10 minutes or so, guys. Um, so we've just got there as well. So I haven't gone to Matt, but Matt, one that was extremely popular from the, from the participants was the Lonro and Vintage Triumph, which I believe you've actually still got shares in, if, if I'm right. Uh, unfortunately, we've got shares in plenty, Corey, but not in him, I'm sorry. Um, Lovely black son of Lonro, great mover. Um, you know, um, Simon's talking, you know, analogy with, uh, with owning a car. You know, owning a black Lonro is probably like owning a red Ferrari. You know, it's... Uh, Pretty good. He, he, he's a beautiful horse. And, um, uh, yeah, we were delighted to, uh, to, to get him. And I'm glad other people out there, he, uh, they, they picked him as well. And, Troy, last but not least, uh, you said you were the underbidder on a horse that you believe was the next black caviar. If you'd like to explain, we've got a few people who voted for that horse as well. You could explain a little bit of that. It's an exceed and excel. Yeah, she was just a queen of a filly. I went back and looked at her probably four or five times. And <clears throat> similar to black caviar, every time I looked pa walked past and saw someone looking at her, I'd take another look. And in answer to Rebecca's question that just came through on the chat, I just see the way that she was parading, the way that she was behaving, the way that she was acting, the way that she was walking. Uh, she was out of stack and um, she just didn't turn her hair. Nothing bothered her. And I think that's a really good attribute to have. Um, I was specking her, so I didn't have anyone for her. And I ended up being underbidder to Clinton McDonald. I can't even remember how much it was. I, I try and put it out of my mind again. Was that Esker Lodge as well? Yeah, Esker. Yeah, I remember the horse. Yeah, yeah, she's a beautiful filly and uh, under bitter, so we'll we'll try and forget about that one for a little while. I'll make three fifty. I've got a few. Yeah, three fifty. It went for Troy. We've got a few questions coming through about pin hooking, but that will be in a future webinar, guys. So I'll I'll try and stay focused on the three briefs for today, but we will try and cover all of these different sectors, but we could talk for hours if we start to branch off. Uh, Troy is going through as quickly as he can and answering the questions that you all have. Um, we will now go to the poll for this last one. So the poll will be live and we'll give you one minute to do this one. Remember that there will be prizes at the end of this. So best that you vote for your horse that you wrote in your homework to have a chance of the prize, but also you need to win. So at the and moment, uh, the Exceed and Excel is getting a few here, Troy. You might win a win an English hat. <laughs> hey, Troy, you never said before, on the back of Nature Script, do you still do X-rays? Yeah, I do, Will. Only, I, I trade a lot of horses, so to, Resell to the Hong Kong market, they've got to be spotless. And unfortunately, I, I can't take any blemishes if I'm doing one for a trade. Um, if I'm buying them for myself, I don't look at all. We've got Lonro's got that, 10%. That, that, that Teofilo cult that you bought, I reckon, was probably the nicest cult in the sale as well. I love it. 
It's a two-horse race here, guys, between Snitzel and Provocative and Exceed and Excel and Swain. So 10 more seconds. Can the Snitzel get over the line? It's got to be the Swain. And Troy, you have won, but I won't be giving the prize to yourself. I reckon you would have a few English hats over the time, but I will go back through the homework and make sure I choose somebody to win win this English hat here, guys. So thanks to Simon and his team. Uh, we will now. So. Yeah, you, I'm sure that you could get a few free hats out of those 22 horses, Will. Um, and there, there it is. I was, I was expecting that you'd be able to talk people around here, Troy. So I've actually got the, there it is, the horse that you were the underbidder on. So um, we're, we're now just going to go quickly through the questions and answers. So probably uh, favourite broodmare sire, if we could get a quick one, one word answer from all of you there. So start with Troy. Um, keep the faith, funnily enough. Going up, and look, at it, look up his stats. There's not many out there, but... He's a freak of a uh, brood missile. Matt? Charge forward. Will? Uh, Galileo. And Simon? I actually, what Troy said is quite right. Keep the faith. has got re re unbelievable stats, but I'm going to go with reduced choice because he's just the best. Uh, good question here. Do you, so one for Troy. Do you look at horses differently if it, is at the cheap end of the price range compared to a higher price range? Uh, yeah, you've got to obviously be more forgiving if you're, you know, quite often I'm trying to buy a Rolls Royce with uh, a Commodore budget. So I, I, you've got to make exceptions and sometimes you might get a bent leg, but you've got to make that judgment and see whether you think it'll make it as a racehorse. Um, and hopefully you see something there that not other, a lot of other people do. Yep, uh, I've got one here that I can answer from Luke. It's just, does ongoing costs come into these briefs uh, because the cost of training a, a horse obviously plays a huge part. So uh, for people like myself that get involved, it, I've always been told to work it out on around forty to $50,000 training fees for the year on 100% and then work that out then with the percentage that you would go for. Uh, and obviously then, in my opinion, you, you're better off to go for... 5% of something that's going to be a half decent runner than having 100% in some horse that you, you have to pay 10 times the value of the horse to train it. So um, I think, would you agree with that, Troy? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, the next one is one word answer again, guys, or one horse answer again. So who is your favourite first season sire at the moment? Um, capitalist. I was hoping you'd say Maurice, Troy, but anyway. <laughs> um, Matt? I'll say Shalar. Arrowfield Stallion, son of Invincible Spirit. Will? Uh, Shalar, I'll go extreme choice. And Simon? Yeah, I'm probably a bit of a Shalar fan as well. I'd love to see Cable Bay kick up. Yeah, and is just, just out of interest, uh, Will, uh, is it... Like, how's the risk factor? When you buy, is it, do you, would, would you personally prefer to go for an unproven sire and, and have the, all the accolades if you, if you get in early and it, and it uh, goes on to be a good runner? Or, or do you prefer to sort of lean on the side of caution and, and go for a proven sire? I guess there's a tipping point, um, the price you're paying. Um, the boss seems to go a little bit crazy. Even on a physical, I mean, Kieran, I think, purchased a Seamus Award filly first season Seamus Award for 400 grand. Um, people looked at him sideways, and that's a Tana. Um, Kieran bought a Charm Spirit first season New Zealand for 400 grand, and that was um, Casino, so both two group two winners. Um, yep. So when the boss falls in love one, uh, client or no client, he doesn't stop. Um, but yeah, in terms of you know, buying horses in the mass. If they're first season size, we have no issue with them. Um, it's just obviously at the tipping point, you know, you're not going to go out and spend you know, 600 yep. grand on a first season size. Yeah, no, that makes sense. We brought a lot of first season size this year. I, mean, I think we got five Shalars, three Capitalists, three Extravagants, three Extreme Choices, um, you know. Yep, uh, that, that, that makes sense. Uh, and obviously, what reiterating that some of these figures would scare somebody getting into the market, but 
but once again, you can get small small amounts, or you can uh, go in even five percent. You can go in with twenty of your mates, for example. Um, so so there are plenty of options there, depending on which stable you go to, and 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 ask those questions. So there is a question here that's been there for a while about brood mares for breeding now um, from Jamie. So just on that, Jamie, we are touching on uh, understanding pedigrees next week. So so I'd say that that would be a great uh, question for Kristen Menning, who will be on next week, and a couple of our um, experts in that field. Uh, Simon, are you surprised at the prices that some horses sell for? Uh, a lot are over the reserves, or or are you also surprised at some that get passed in that you thought would sell? Uh, absolutely, Corey. I think it's particularly difficult for anybody to actually accurately value horses. And there's a number of horses that we could sit back and quote that have gone through and made you know, maybe you know, two and three million dollars that you think, you know, you're hoping that they might be able to make five or six hundred thousand, they make two or three million dollars. And I've, you know, from, as an auctioneer, I can probably give you a lot of stories on that basis. And similarly, there's plenty of horses that we value at, at six or seven hundred thousand dollars that for one reason or another um, are only making two hundred or two fifty. Uh, we we tend to, when it comes to a yearling catalogue, we would normally value every horse just as an academic exercise as auctioneers. And we probably then end up at the end of the day being no more than five to ten percent out over the whole value of the sale. But some horses we can be out by three and four hundred percent. So uh, it's not easy to value a horse. And it comes down to what the respective buyers want to value a horse at. And sometimes you do see a bidding duel. And I've you know I've been involved in 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 auctioneering bidding duels where you think a horse is nearly fried at at five hundred thousand. The next thing it's making three million. So. Um, yeah, it's, uh, there's a, uh, it's, they're, they're not an easy product to actually value. They're a bit like a piece of art. They're very rare. Yeah, no, it makes sense. And I think that's the beauty of it is that it's, it, there's no perfect science to it. So it actually really um, it opens it up for anyone to have a chance. Uh, so I think we're, we're now getting on. So next week, we touched on next week. Next week, we'll be understanding pedigrees. How that will work for all our participants is you will get three horses. So you can see Winks there in the middle. That will be one of them. Um, but you will get three horses. Um, you will, They'll all be mares. Uh, and you will then need to uh, choose a sire that you would breed that mare to and you will have a budget to do that. So a little bit different to today. Um, probably a little bit less uh, study, but I'm sure depending on how much study you like to do, there's there's lots there. Um, Troy, you spoke about a lot of a lot about success or near misses, any tragic buys, and do you have many that you've bought with that you thought would be really good but just couldn't go at all? Oh yeah, many, too many to uh, speak about. We haven't got long enough to go through all of them, unfortunately. No, that's but, okay. Uh, yeah, obviously, uh, there's there's a hell of a lot that I've bought before and thought they were good, and, and so much so that even you know bringing them up, developing them, watching them work, uh, galloping, and then thinking, gee, I've got a good one here, and, and they never go on. I've got a a really good uh, story. I bought a, a red ransom gelding, um, and my father was training at the time. I was racing manager for him, and he used to share the box out in the middle with John Sadler. And I got a fight and gone in that morning and I got a phone call from dad and he said, um, you've got a superstar. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, that red ransom, he said, he's just an absolute freak. He said, I'm sitting here watching it with John Sadler. We've never seen a horse gallop like this before. So I went out and looked for the mum. The mother had passed away, but I bought the sister. Thought I was quite smart. Um, unleashed the horse. He had five runs for us, couldn't win a race. And and um, we ended up, I ended up selling him and he went to a young trainer up in Sydney that is just kicking off. Um, and the young trainer rang the guy that bought him and said, I'm not sure what they, these blokes down in Melbourne were doing, but this horse is a superstar. And I don't think he won a race for Chris Waller or others. So, uh, there's those stories all over the place. He, he ended up winning a, a picnic race uh, half an hour at some track away from Queen Deanne, but uh, it was a shocker. Yeah, no, I'm sure there's lots of stories like that. I think we are getting a bit late now, so we may wrap up. Uh, one, one final question just for Will. Um, with sprinters, middle distance and stayers, what, what's different? Like what really essentially is different for the untrained eye? What, what makes them different? If you could try and wrap that question up as quickly as you can, but what makes them different? 
Uh, well, breeding obviously is a big part of it. Um, and, and the physical um, of a horse, you know, stays usually have those long low loping actions, you know, got deep girths. Um, and there's obviously breeding that, you know, the horse is out of Galloway, man, you're back at the stay, but you know, that's not necessarily the case. I mean, you look at Kieran, I think uh, taking Jamaica into the Oaks in the Crawford Cup uh, before he, she won the Oaks, everyone was saying he was mad. You know, she's out of a general on the Dean Mare by Moe by Charlie, and he's had in his mind, she looked like a stayer, she works like a stayer, she's got the lung capacity like a stayer, I think she's a stayer. And so you're looking at, you know, I think her mum won a 900, you know, very short course race. Uh, by Jim the Dean, who was a out and out right, you know, thousand meter horse. Um, so you just got to take horses as you find them. I think there's a lot of research you can do into them, and um, but yeah, you, I think you just take horses as you find them. Yep, no, really interesting, and I think we will wrap up there, guys. So uh, what I wanted to say on behalf of all the participants and myself as well is is thank you not only for coming on for this hour, but thank you for supporting the initiative, and thank you for giving up your time throughout the probably the last month uh, on and off with different questions I've had surrounding the initiative and getting it up and going and uh, all, all four of you have been so supportive of that so uh, I couldn't thank you enough and I'm sure that the participants have got something from this uh, and and over the next four weeks guys uh, we will be covering many topics so if things weren't covered in this one please send your feedback to myself uh, obviously constructive where possible uh, send through anything that you would like to know and I will as long as it's given to me in time I'll try and work that into the webinars as much as possible and and get the most out of it but thank you to all four so uh, Will, Matt, Simon and Troy absolutely uh, outstanding I've, I've learned a lot and I hope that all the uh, participants have also. Thanks Corey. May I just say Sorry. one last thing because I'm not a, I'm not a horse trainer um, the, the idea of the people that have joined you tonight the one thing to probably stress to them is that the the in, in, the involvement with the racehorse can be massive a massive amount of, uh, of enjoyment right from the word go so enjoy the whole thing go from the yearling sales right through make contact with our outstanding victorian horse trainers and and, and treat it as a as a real joy to be involved with if you end up with a, a horse that's really an outstanding race was fantastic but there's actually a lot of fun a lot of socializing created by it so don't be frightened about making contact with the trainers and, and just talk to them about getting involved it's a lot of fun it's a great thrill yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, going out to, uh, I remember a Christmas party that Troy held at Malua. Um, I remember going out to Archie Alexander's stable, uh, the Mar stable. Uh, and, and, and honestly, you're always welcomed, obviously, with uh, coronavirus, it makes it difficult. But once, once we're past that, it, it, it's such an accessible industry. And just to go and meet the horses and see the horses is almost worth your, your small share. Sure is. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much, Troy. Cheers, guys. Thanks, Will. And thanks, Matt. Well done, Corey. So we will stop the recording there, guys. And thanks very much again. Pleasure, Corey. Well done, mate. Congratulations. I hope that uh, you can keep, keep working on it and it keeps going the right way for you. And anything that uh, I'm sure anybody, any of the panellists can do to help you or... Um, or, or English individually, we'd be only too pleased. It's, um, it's a compliment to you to be able to, to, uh, to advance a project like this and good luck, mate. Thank you, guys.